Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today is a very special day for Dead Meat, because it was two years ago that I released my very first Kill Count, with my awful hair, covering Friday the 13th. Since then, there has not been a single week where I failed to release at least one, and sometimes two, Kill Count episodes. That's wildly impressive, if I may say so myself. To celebrate this milestone, I'm gonna do a fuck it episode. What do I mean by that? I mean fuck it. Today I'm looking at Demonic Toys, a Full Moon production released direct-to-video in 1992. For the record, I was going to do a movie called Dead Me, cause that would have been neat with the name and all. But all due respect to the people who made it, it feels kinda like a student film version of 28 Days Later. And I just wanted to have a bit more fun with this anniversary episode. And what could be more fun than Full Moon? For those of you who don't know, Full Moon is a production company founded by Charles Band, and they just make like, the worst movies, dude. They're the ones behind Subspecies, The Ginger Dead Man, and most famously, the Puppet Master franchise. Which, yes, I own a Blu-ray box set of, but no, I won't be covering anytime soon because there are fucking 13 of those goddamn movies. Demonic Toys is, strangely enough, kind of a ripoff of Puppet Master, and also kind of a ripoff of Child's Play. As with many Full Moon pictures, it's also got a whole bunch of random shit thrown into the mix. This ain't just about killer toys, son. It's also got demon kids with glowy eyes and gas mask girls riding around on tricycles. It's a very bad movie but often becomes so bad it's good, thanks mostly to the barely trying voice performance of the killer doll baby oopsie daisy and the over trying shouty acting of Bentley Mitchum as Mark. Oh my god, somebody shot him! How many people will end up murdered by toys and demon kids? Let's find out and get to the kills. The movie begins with a dream sequence full of rocking chairs and ticking clocks. Two kids, one fair and one a little cheater, play War, the card game that surprisingly can be played in Vegas. Don't do it though, craps is where it's at. This pre-adolescent parlor game is a recurring dream of police officer Judith Gray, played by Tracy Scoggins of Dynasty fame. During a conversation filmed in uncomfortable head-on close-ups, Judith tells her police partner and paramour, Matt Cable, that she's pregnant with his child. Oh, that's great! Oh shit, I can't tell if the character's bad at lying or the actor's bad at acting. Before they can start discussing baby names though, another car pulls up with two gun runners inside. Lincoln, the leader, and Hess, who doesn't know how to chew gum right. It's not a tongue condom there, buddy. The cops conduct a sting operation, and when Lincoln incriminates himself, Matt pulls out his gun. Uh, you're under arrest. He ends up shooting Hess real fast, and then gets shot in return by Lincoln, and his slow motion fall to the ground and complete stillness while the criminals get away indicate that Matt is our our first kill on the count. Could someone check if Judith's alright? Oh baby no! Okay, maybe back the camera out of her face though. Judith chases the bad guys in a scene that's a direct ripoff of the beginning of Child's Play. Seriously, that shit's blatant. They're running into a toy warehouse. Inside, Lincoln forces his partner to secede from him and the injured Hess crawls around until he finds a glowing blue spotlight shining on the ground. He crawls into it like he's ready to get beamed up Scotty, only pausing to comment on all the toys he sees around him. Fucking toys. Fucking toys, brother. When Hess bleeds out into the floor beneath him, some kind of bullshit dark magic happens, and a few of the toys come to life via shoddy effects. The first one Hess notices is a jack-in-the-box who pulls its own crank. This springy boy, named Jack Attack, pops out to scare Hess, and instantly becomes my favorite demonic toy because of his incessant insane laughter. <laughs> Jack Attack attacks Hess and tears at his gooey gooey cheek flesh, all while shaking a rattle he's holding in his tail. Jack goes on break and allows Grizzly Teddy to take his turn, and why that bear just bites Hess's fingers right off. Pewee, these fingers aren't free range. Then, uh, then this kid rolls up, wearing what, a Klasky Supo Grateful Dead shirt? Hi guy. He's not your guy, Flan! Through that modulated voice, the kid thanks Hess for waking him up from his long sleep. And I've gotta say, kid actor Daniel Cherney does a pretty decent job lip sinking his lines. We're gonna have a lot of fun here tonight, friend. We're gonna raise hell. <laughs> Although, I wouldn't exactly trust him when it comes to reviews of this movie. I think it's a pretty bad story. 
I think it's good. Oh, also fun fact, three years after this, he'd be cast as the main kid in Children of the Corn 3, Urban Harvest, which is part of another series that won't get kill counted anytime soon, because there are ten of those fucking things too. Hess's death ultimately comes from this demonic robot toy named Mr. Static. With Hess helpless and full of very obvious squibs on his chest, seriously, it looks like he has super hard nips on his belly, Mr. Static shoots some blue laser beams into the gun runner, blowing the squibs up and killing him once and for all. Man, those squibs. Full moon movies were not meant to be seen in HD. Now that we've met most of the toys, let's take a moment to honor the man who made them, since sadly, he just passed away on March 17th. John Carl Buechler was a mainstay of the horror genre. Not only did he design the demonic toys, who, despite this movie's low budget, look pretty cool and scary, but he and his company Magical Media Industries also did special effects work on over 60 other projects, including Troll, The Ghoulies Movies, and Hatchet, where he played the character Jack Cracker in parts 1 and 2. He also directed a few horror films, most famously Friday the 13th Part 7, The New Blood, which was the first installment of the series to feature Kane Hodder as Jason Voorhees. By all accounts, Buechler was a warm and loving man, and it's a shame that when he was diagnosed with prostate cancer, he needed a GoFundMe page to help pay for medical expenses. That's super fucked up, man. He passed away at the too young age of 66, but we'll always have his work to remember him by. Thanks for everything you did, John. A security guard named Charnetsky hears Hess's screams, but ends up blaming the noise on the TV, which is playing Full Moon's Puppet Master, by the fucking way. Charnetsky, who's played by Pete Shrum, the bartender in T2, calls his favorite chicken shack, the Chunky Chicken, and puts in his usual order. Legs and breasts, none of that wing shit. And bring me plenty of honey for my fucking roll this time. You assholes always skimp on that. He doesn't trust the trickster that answers the phone at first, so instead he talks to his best bud Mark, who fulfills the order by grabbing some chicken sitting out on the counter with his non-smoking hand. Now, we paid for the neon chicken sign and the giant car chicken, so make sure to get them both in the shot, okay? Yeah, hold that shot for a while too. Put that money on the screen. Thank you. Upstairs in the warehouse, Judith, remember her, has tracked Lincoln to a storage room where they have a crappy firefight and then a crappy fist fight. Oh damn, he be going for her kidneys there. She wins in the end, cuffs the dude to a desk, and says that he's under arrest, asshole. After they hear Hess scream, the door to the room closes on its own, trapping them inside so we can have uninterrupted sweaty close-ups of both of them. Yeah, that's nice and wet. Mark gets to the warehouse and brings Charnetsky his chunky chicken, and the two of them prove their masculinity to each other by drinking brewskis and looking at porn on the job. Sort of brings a tear to your eye, don't you? Yeah, that's something else. Hehe, <laughs> I love naked chicks. Their dude fest is interrupted when they hear Judith firing her gun in order to get help. They find her in the storage room where she shows them her badge and the psycho criminal who killed her baby daddy. Charnetsky leaves to call the police station, but right away he gets knocked down by Grizzly Teddy with a baseball bat. That's witnessed by Mark, who's standing watch, but he's not concerned. Probably a little drunk. He might be more alarmed if he saw what Charnetsky sees next, though. Hi, you fat fuck. I'm baby Oopsie Daisy. Will you be my special friend? Oopsie Daisy brags about walking, talking, and shitting his pants before he grabs Charnetsky's gun off the ground and says a Chucky-esque one-liner. Playtime! Let's see if that gets Mark concerned. Oh my god, somebody shot him! I fucking love that line. Somebody shot him! Charnetsky gets a wraparound from Jack Attack and then mauled by Grizzly Teddy, whose puppeteer accidentally gets his sleeve and hairy arm in the shot sometimes. Damn, that's bad. Charnetsky dies from being bitten in sticky close-ups and stabbed in the baby maker by the baby doll. But not before one more puppeteer sleeve sneaks into frame. Oh man, just crop that shit out, Full Moon. It's a simple damn fix. Baby Oopsie Daisy drags Charnetsky's corpse away and down some stairs, all the way to that glowing spot on the floor, where he uses a yellow crayon to draw a pentagram around the body. That right there is a real weird image out of context. Also weird is this, the most ridiculous character entrance I've ever seen. Somebody wanna tell me what the fuck is going on here? It's the toys. Someone's inside the toys. Oh hey, thanks, Bent Lady. Nobody else around here seemed to know. This chick, Anne, is a runaway escaping her abusive father, and she tells the others that, yeah, some evil toys are running around and have locked them inside this warehouse. Judith gets pissed and knocks some blocks off a table, and the blocks get all rude and tell the humans, death you. They hear some disembodied giggling, and then Lincoln becomes possessed. In that modulated evil kid voice, he tells the others he needs their bodies and flesh before zip-zap 
stabs Opping into the evil little boy who Judith recognizes from her nightmare. Wait, what's out that window? Is that like film equipment out that window? What the fuck? Did you see him? What, the snarky boy in the handcuff a second ago? Or was there like a crew member walking around in the background? In an effort to escape, they turn to the air ducts, which, whoa, these things are much bigger on the inside. You could fit a whole damn family of McLeans in there. Come out to the warehouse, we'll fight some demons, have a few laughs. From the air ducts, Anne and Mark see something legitimately creepy. This gang of Garandan girls riding around on tricycles and wearing gas masks. Anne says they're not the same as the toys, they're some kind of non-corporeal spirits. And although that doesn't make sense, it's still scary to me when the girls point up at them through the ceiling vent. I don't know why, but that image has always stuck with me since I was a kid. I actually find it pretty damn creepy. Judith, who has stayed back to watch over Lincoln, fails to notice when he figures out that he can pick the lock on his cuffs. Instead, she gets distracted by the evil boy's voice coming out of a dollhouse. And after she looks into it, we transition into another weird fantastical scene where that kid has to lip sync some more. Where are we? Inside the doll's house. It's part of the astral plane. The boy tells Judith that he's an evil demon who can take any form he wants to, like low-grade Halloween costumes or even dead baby daddies. But what he really wants is a new actual living body for his soul to inhabit, something he hasn't attempted since 66 years ago when a satanic cult tried to do him a solid. But the baby body he picked that time died during a miscarriage. Oh, he's not gonna make it. That body ended up in the dirt at a build site, which eventually became the location of this warehouse. The demon has been stuck in that corpse all this time until he was finally able to come back through a little bit of blood magic. Now he wants to try to be born again, this time using Judith's womb. At the moment of birth, I ride shotgun down the old birth canal. Oh man, can this thing get any grosser? Then I'll come for you. Then we could do that nasty. Oh, yes, yes it can. When Judith wakes up from her dollhouse adventure, she finds herself alone, Lincoln having abolished the handcuffs from his wrist. The toys enter into the air ducts, and the first to find Anne and Mark is Baby Oopsie Daisy, who just, uh, says two of the same lines he said earlier. I like you. Will you be my special friend? Playtime! He stabs Mark in the ankle, and Mr. Static shoots Anne in the side a few times, but since these things are just fucking toys after all, the teens are able to escape them and climb out into Charnetsky's security office. The toys try shooting at them, but Mark makes a flamethrower with some bug spray and lights them on fire, scaring them away. They're only gone long enough for him to get a shotgun out of a gun locker, cause after that, Jack Attack breaks through the window and winds up gnawing Mark's neck, while Baby Oopsie Daisy returns with a green melty face and starts stabbing at Anne with a pen. Mark rips Jack attack apart, resulting in some real disgusting goopy green gore, and then kills the giggly clown toy by shooting it apart with the shotgun. Aw, poor Jack attack. And poor Anne, I guess, too, since all that baby doll stabbing has left her dead. Oopsie daisy! Don't say oopsie, you fuck. You did that on purpose. At least the bloody eye makeup looks halfway decent. After oopsie daisy escapes from the shotgun, Mark heads out into the warehouse. He encounters those gas mask girls, who then turn into a little girl without a gas mask, who then turns into a a sexy grown-up version of herself, which is really kind of weird. Why make her a little girl first? Especially if she's gonna get naked, ew. After the ghost babe turns into Anne's corpse for a mo, Mark finally finishes this slideshow of spirits, only to get accosted by Lincoln and knocked into some boxes. Great, now the crazy guy has a shotgun. But not for long, since he quickly gets shot in the head by Judith. Just when things were getting interesting. You have a bullet in your brain. Fall down, dude. Thank you. He's finally dead. But careful, Mark and Judith. This is the moment when the supposedly dead killer comes back to life for one last scare. Who's a little chatterbox? One with all the golden locks. Mark says, not in my movie, by decapitating Lincoln with the gun stock. I'm getting sick of this in a major fucking way! <laughs> yeah, me too, dude. The evil boy's powers are almost at their maximum strength, or whatever, which he tells to his toy collection while a big Festifool's mask sits in the background. But don't celebrate too soon, kid, cause all of a sudden, this movie throws a claymation nutcracker into the mix. It's completely fucking random, but you know what? The effects look pretty good, so let's just try to stay positive here, okay? Mark and Judith run into baby oopsie daisy only for mark to shoot him into pieces like he ain't shit then a bunch of other ugly ass toys quote unquote come alive which really just means get moved a little bit by off-screen hands there's an absurdly long series of shots where the two humans shoot into the camera and we watch toys explode and it goes on until mark already bleeding from his ears just can't take any more of baby oopsie daisy's shitty lines could this be the fucking end of baby oopsie daisy so fucking what <laughs> so fucking what 
Okay. With the rest of the toys dead, Grizzly Ted, or whatever his stupid name is, randomly turns into a life-size nasty bear. But better not show him as he tosses Mark aside, cause you know the full costume's gonna look almost as stupid as he sounds. <laughs> He chases Judith into a room and begins to break the door away, but right before she turns the gun on herself, that nutcracker feller walks in and tells her to follow him. Eh, sure, ain't like she got a better plan. Too bad she loses track of the helper and runs into her zombie partner again, who tears out his eyes to be all like, Ooga! And that's enough to make Judith faint, apparently. He drags Judith onto the pentagram and, wait, what is going on down there? What am I looking at in that hole? Is that more film equipment, or what? Anyway, after she's tied down, the kid shows up to be evil and snarky, only to get interrupted by Mark and his yelling. All right, you little shit! The grizzly old Ted chases Mark away, allowing the kid to transform into a demon and be gross some more. First, I'm gonna crawl on top of you and do the nasty. He takes too long with his bad guy monologue, though. And during that time, Mark's able to get into his chicken mobile, shoot the grizzly Ted, and then run him into the wall with his car. Here I come, you Holy shit, that thing looks like a costume of Ralph the Rat from Rampage. Judith gets saved by the Nutcracker Boy after he comes out of nowhere and shoots the evil demon away. Then he turns into a real live boy in a Nutcracker costume, while the demon reverts back into Finn Balor, or the evil kid. And we get just what every horror movie needs, a grade school aged boy fight. Where's George Bluth with the video camera? Good boy eventually throws bad boy right into a blade that stabs him through the torso and transforms him back into a demon. Oh, I guess that was Judith with the Nutcracker sword. Good work, girl. The demon is vanquished from reality and Judith's nightmare, and Mark finishes off the bear and his chunky chicken career by blowing up the car that's pinning the beast against the wall. I guess with all that over, we just need an explanation as to who the fuck this Nutcracker kid is. I'm your son. The son you're going to have. Wait, what? That can't be right. Maybe kid actor William Thorne can explain it a little better. I'm like, I'm like this kid. He's like a fair boy from heaven and I'm able to control a toy. Oh, yeah, now it all makes sense. The movie ends with Mark asking Judith what she's doing with that doll and her explaining to him that it's her unborn baby boy. Thanks for, uh, whatever that was, Full Moon. How many people were killed by demonic toys or just, you know, getting shot? Let's find out by the numbers. <laughs> Only five people died in demonic toys, and only three of those were from the toys themselves. Pathetic. The victims included four dudes and only one random vent lady, making them 80% male, and with a runtime of 83 minutes, we had a kill on average every 16.6 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Anne, because I guess it had the best makeup effects, and eye stuff is usually effective. Doll machete for lamest hmm. kill will go to Matt, because gun kills are boring. And that's it. Demonic Toys came out in 1992 and was written by David S. Goyer, who would go on to write Batman Begins, Man of Steel, and Batman vs. Superman. Crazy, right? Oh, and hey, you can all shut up now, because next week is Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <gasps> Until then, though, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching the Demonic Toys Kill Count. I want to thank some patrons like John Hoskins, Christopher Bartha, Digital Synapse, and Cameron Crouch. Yep, for the last two years, I've released at least one Kill Count every single week. I honestly don't know how I never missed a week, but I didn't. Let me know what your favorite Kill Count was. Mine are the Leprechaun and Silent Night, Deadly Night series. Thanks, everybody. Be good people.